Thank you all for coming. Um, this session is really focused on practical solutions towards reaching the sustainable development goals, but reaching them in a way that is inclusive of persons with disabilities, specifically with the changes we have to make in the built environment. My name is Victor Pineda. I'm the president of GATES, which is the Global Alliance for Accessible Technologies and Environments, as well as the president of World Enabled. I have the honor to co-chair the Global Network on Disability Inclusive and Accessible Urban Development, a multi-stakeholder platform to promote um, accessible interventions in the built environment, as well as uh, one of the negotiators in the Habitat 3 process that helped us create the new urban agenda. And I'll start off the conversation today by drawing attention to three critical and timely frameworks that we should all be aware of. And these are not only the clear responsibilities that we have towards implementing the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and specifically Article 9, which now has been in force for almost 10 years, and we see uh, some progress, but not enough, but really leveraging the commitments by member states to uh, create targets and indicators on sustainable development goal number 11, which is on inclusive and resilient cities, and specific targets that governments have to ensure that cities and public places and transportation infrastructure is inclusive and accessible. But I'm also going to share some of the progress we've made uh, with UN Habitat, as well as with international donors, and making a clear commitment to this third international instrument, which is the new urban agenda, and specifically having disability incorporated throughout this uh, document, 15 references and a standalone paragraph. We just came back, Fernando, myself, and, and some others in this room here from Kuala Lumpur, where it was held the ninth World Urban Forum. That means that the previous eight World Urban Forums did not incorporate the issue of accessibility. But at the ninth World Urban Forum, we were incredibly active and put accessibility at the center of the new urban agenda. So what we have now with colleagues working on inclusive urban development is a clear commitment that accessibility is a core principle for the successful implementation of the new urban agenda. So I encourage you to look at the new urban agenda and encourage you to look at the Sustainable Development Goal number 11 and look at pushing your governments and working with your governments on shaping a concrete implementation plan on these efforts. Our distinguished panelists today are going to share their work specifically on building the kind of world that we all want, which is a world without barriers. Like the Zero Project, we all are committed to having a world with zero barriers that are limiting our economic potential, our social vitality, and also the political commitment to full and equal participation by all citizens. Each one of the panelists will present uh, in a very limited amount of time uh, the, the steps that must be taken so that by the year 2030, we have an inclusive urban future. We have a, cities that reflect uh, the needs and lifestyles and preferences of all people. Because disability isn't just about a medical condition or some kind of a medical framework. It's about the diversity of all of our uh, human capacity to adjust and build the cities that allow us to contribute. So without with further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, Fernando Jacome a good friend and a key leader in looking at governance and the kind of structures that will allow accessibility 
to be scaled up. Fernando, there's been a lot of fragmented efforts on accessibility. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on how we can ensure a more systemic and integrated approach. Thank you. Well, thanks, Victor. Thanks a lot for your, for your words. Uh, as you already said before, uh, well, my background is uh, I have been working for the governmental sector for a lot of years now. Uh, first, I started with the government of Ecuador, and where I was the director of foreign affairs at the, mean, uh, the secretariat for the technic uh, the technical secretariat for the inclusion, for the comprehensive inclusion of persons with disabilities, an institution that worked for the vice presidency of Ecuador, once started by the now president of, of Ecuador, uh, Mr. Lenin Moreno, and then uh, I had the chance to work into the probably the most dynamic. Uh, process of international cooperation in the field of disabilities into a region which produced uh, a model of comprehensive attention uh, with uh, an strategic alliance with more than 16, 16 countries. So uh, afterwards I have worked a lot into legal, uh, regional, national, international legal frameworks including the new urban agenda. I was part of the coordination team of the Habitat 3 conference and also the Ecuadorian negotiation team. So. I have been participating and trying to mainstream in this work into the, in, in, into, into the international uh, frame, frameworks. But uh, I, I would like to take some specific things that I have learned through my experience, and which are pretty simple. Uh, there's an urgent need for us, uh, and this we have come to realize uh, lately, pretty lately, sadly that there's an important thing to understand that universal inclusion and that universal accessibility is a core principle and is a concept that will not only allow the inclusion of persons with disabilities, but this is a universal concept that, and that the speech should be shared and should be included through all the political leaders. What I mean is that there's a lot of persons that understand and political decision makers that take disability and responsibilities with persons with disabilities uh, only as, uh, I don't know, as charity, only as social programs, but they don't understand that inclusion is a right and that we have to fulfill this right and to fight to, to secure the implementation of this right. And for this, we have to create a create linkage, a create link among political institutions and technical bodies. And that's what we are trying to do, not only at Gates and World Enabled or the Disability, and the, the DOUT, which is the network for the development of uh, in inclusive urban development at a global scope, but it is quite important to do that at all levels. We have to create a direct uh, relationship among the legal frameworks at a regional, national, and local level by making this direct relationship among the technical part of the work, but also about the politics. Uh, that's pretty important to understand. The core principle as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a security of inclusion for all of us, but also it, it has to be secured through the implementation of policies. It is uh, also important to, to say that through my work or through our work as a government or as, a, as an NGO, it is pretty important to state that uh, policies should, should not have to be disaggregated. You have a lot of efforts at a regional, national, local level, but regularly they tend to be pretty disaggregated. And this is quite, uh, this is not like the correct path to continue working on. Uh, at the moment, for example, we are working into the strengthening of the of, of the inclusive urban development in, into our region by uh, linking the national governments with NGOs and with civil society through a process where we want to assess the construction processes of the regional plans of implementation of the new urban agenda. What are we intending to do right now? What is our, our idea? At the moment, uh, as you may know, the new urban agenda uh, is being is being implemented, or at least all the countries are trying to implement the new urban agenda at a, a worldwide. So what we are doing right now is creating direct links with regional and national institutions in order to secure 
that universal accessibility should be a core concept of inclusive urban development. So uh, what we are doing right now with Victor, for example, is we are, uh, we are going to sign cooperation agreements with the governments of Ecuador, with the government of Panama, and with the Forum of Ministries of Housing and Urban Development of Latin America and the Caribbean in order to secure that the implement, regional implementation plan for a for region will include uh, this principle as a, as a key principle of, inclusive, of, of urban development. But also, we want to make uh, this in order to secure that we will have a direct influence into the national plans of implementation of the, of the new urban agenda. So uh, by this, we are working also with Gates, and we will also work with uh, a speci a specific technical institutions in order to make sure that civil society, along with uh, state institutions, will work, will work together, uh, with the government and public society will work together in order to uh, strengthen and to construct this framework. So that's kind of the effort that we want to do right now, like with pretty practical actions to advise. Uh, we will start with two national urban, uh, two national plans for the implementation of the new urban agenda, and then we will go through the regional implementation plan in order to secure that we will have a direct influence in order to continue working with all the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we are starting like in two weeks with Ecuador. And then we will move forward with Panama and the Forum of Ministries of Housing and Urban Development in the coming months. So that's kind of, kind of our strategy in order to secure that uh, the implementation of the new urban agenda uh, will include accessibility. This is the moment. Uh, now that all the countries are working into the implementation of the new urban agenda plans, we think that this is a key strategic moment to secure that universal accessibility could be implemented and could be included into the text. And this, of course, will have an influence afterwards into the legislations that all the countries are also creating in order to implement the new human agenda. So we think that this is a pretty important moment in order to secure our cooperation as, as for example, as Gates or as World Enabled or, or as international society. So that's what I think, Victor, that there's this really important need to understand that universal accessibility is not only a thing of disabilities, of persons with disabilities, but it, is, it will work for all of us, even when we get older, when we get sick, it will work for all of us. And that this, as a principle, should be linked among the political and the technical level. And it is quite important to take advantage of this situation on the implementation of the new urban agenda in order to secure these, these principles to be adopted and to be included into the regional, national, and local frames. So that's what I think. Thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, I want to just take a moment before we go to Christine, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that she's doing on accessibility, just to see in the audience, raise your hand if this is the first time you're hearing of the new urban agenda. Raise your hand, first time, if you haven't heard. Okay. So the New Urban Agenda is almost a local process to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. So a lot of the national commitments in the Sustainable Development Goals create requirements for national governments, but yet local government cities uh, needed to have a way to be much more engaged and empowered in creating local policies, programs, and interventions. And so we felt that it was very important to work at the city level and to work with municipalities to create these interventions uh, like accessibility and inclusion. Now, Christine, who is next here to speak, has been doing just that. With Ciudad Accessible, she's really been looking at concrete interventions at the level of the city to, to really promote accessibility. But I want to know, Christine, besides the interventions that are being made uh, you know, on a local level, how can we take this knowledge and scale it up? I think Fernando gave us a framework for a national and regional cooperation. What are your ideas for ensuring that by the year 2030, cities can really be accessible budgets can be allocated, and sort of the institutions that govern urban development 
can incorporate a, a holistic view that include persons with disabilities. Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Franz from Chile. I represent Corporación Ciudad Accesible. And uh, I tell, tell you our story. Since 1999, we are working in accessibility. 20 years ago, the accessibility was not a matter in Chile. Accessibility in those years are or mean vehicular access, rainwater evacuation. Then we must start learning from the beginning. How? From the dire experience. Pamela, our founder, had two children with disabilities, Martin and Andrea. They are wheelchair users. The family must travel through the city, but where one goes, all go. All the decisions include every member of the family. All the family used to go to friends and family houses, to school, to visit someone, to the church, to the stadium, to the museum, etc. Well, the minivan of these pictures was the beginning of a positive cycle to reach autonomy. It allows them to do things together. We call this positive cycle the accessibility chain, where each link is important. The first step here for Pamela's family to social inclusion was the transport. All this point, we remark always, the needs for accessibility touch everybody at some moment of our lives. In Chile, a study found that one person spent six years of his life with a disabled condition, or reduced mobility, or with his sensorial capacity reduced. But what's going on when one link doesn't work? All the chain is broken. Because if I can't go, I can't be there. If I don't stay there, no inclusion is possible. For this come the premise. The grade of disability depends on the design of the environment, and that was our start point of our work. When one link doesn't work, all the chain is broken. What we do, since 20 years, we're working on development of graphic materials, manual, guidelines, and thematic files. We make seminars, experimental training, diagnosis in accessible buildings, projects, and consulting. We give technical information, education, training, and civil fiscalization to a society that must balance the possibility of displacement and development in order to reach inclusion. In 203, we made the first manual in Chile. And it was the first manual in Latin America of universal accessibility. After that, we made reissue of this material and the last year, we launched an illustrated publication of the accessibility law. During this year, also, we made publication of thematic files. That means a short resume of tip of the common barriers we can find in the environment. The seminars. We introduced the concept of chain of accessibility and accessible routes in public policy, national standards, laws, and norms. Um, our emphasis is that accessible route must be connected and must allow 
all this function, which one? Access, transit, use, and communication. A cycle that needs each link to work well. We make experimental training. They call it put in my place. Experimental trainings allows people from all professions and backgrounds to experience a disability or reducing mobility experiment, like architects, employers, teachers, directors, students. We make diagnosis to existing building, or way to find reasonable adjustment is to make a diagnosis to determine the grade of accessibility of the building or area, detecting inaccessible areas and critical points. This concludes in a strategic plan of accessibility. We show in one picture uh, the accessible space uh, in blue colors and not accessible space in red colors, and the accessible route through them. In other picture, we show um, a university campus with uh, accessible route with critical points in red. Uh, almost it's all in red. We make projects. Our projects are evaluated with a principle of universal design. In the first pictures, you can see a theater and a behind a hospital yard before the project. In the theater, there's no place for people with disability because there is no entrance in front of the stage. In the yard is a lot of steps and stairs and the place is forgotten. Our premise is reasonable adjustment, where we, we maximize the impact with lower cost. The necessity of bringing accessibility to the building, to the natural environment, and to rescue, at the same time, forgotten place in collaboration with other organizations. We can look in this picture after the project. We are changing the, the look and um, the option of universal accessibility. We make consulting. We incorporate the variable of universal accessibility at the beginning of the project, making them cheaper than include at final step of the project. We're working on different level and areas for reviewing housing, park, city, and planning. Our challenge. Our challenge is, uh, one, more research in different areas of urbanism and architecture, like social housing, accessible playground, and accessible public transport network. Two, propose innovation in the way of thinking city, like the creation of an urban accessible plan for the country. And three, develop accessible products in order to bring social inclusion in all public spaces. Finally, in 20 years, we are influencing the changes in Chile. Now, Javier can work in accessible bank. Andrea could go to university. Martin can receive his degree on the stage. Colomba can go to school on her own. It's necessary to think in first in accessibility to be inclusive. And we like to remember the accessibility are simple things with simple solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we know that there have been also major interventions on developing national standards like you just <coughs> described in Chile, also in other parts of the world. So I'd like to hear from engineer Mukhtar, who was the founder of Gates and the past president to give us an overview on his perspective on how we can build these cities 
so that by 2030, we'll have accessible cities that respond to all people. Engineer Bukhtar. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Victor. And good evening for everybody. Uh, I would like to highlight, um, uh, as a founder of GATE, uh, to a number of things that we achieved on the, uh, the goals that we uh, uh, done for GATE since it's been um, founded. My background goes to 1981 when I was an architect in the School of Architecture looking for a master degree thesis. And that year was 1981, the year of disability. So I decided to take that year, take the topic of accessibility as my thesis. And after I get it, I joined a number of organizations uh, till the UNCRPD negotiations happened in New York and uh, in, 19, uh, in 2000. Then uh, uh, I, I joined an ISO uh, technical committee, TC59, to uh, set the first accessibility standard for the world. And uh, with a number of, uh, of uh, my colleagues at that time, we uh, had a meeting in Dublin for the discussion of the ISO, meet, ISO standard. And then we they reviewed the, the, uh, the UNCRPD convention and article number nine, which is accessibility at that time. And we thought there is no organization as such taking care of the accessibility issue. So let us uh, establish or found uh, an organization to deal with accessibility purely. Uh, and then we met in Ottawa. We decided to have this organization gate in, in Ottawa uh, in 2007. So we managed to uh, set uh, goals and missions for, and visions for GATE. Uh, the first president was Betty Dune. She was a Canadian and expert in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the field of accessibility. And we have a board of, of members from different part of the world. Uh, I was the first past president for the organization. Uh, the first three years was difficult, actually. It was not that easy, because we face a lot of uh, things, what to do, how to do it, and how to you know, uh, look to the accessibility from the world perspective. So next, we, uh, we tackled. First thing is we tackled the UN uh, DISA, and we we told them, you know, that the UN buildings are not accessible at that time because 30 years old, and uh, they should make it accessible so the people will, when they come to New York, they will feel there's something accessible. So we uh, we developed the first blueprint for accessibility. Uh, component of the UN Convention. And we uh, had a cooperative agreement with UNDISA to work together as our, uh, an organization that deal with accessibility. Uh, one of the first missions that we had done with the UNESCO was a global report on the use of information and communication uh, an education for persons with disabilities. That was uh, one of our first uh, work with UNESCO at, in Paris. Uh, we went there, we discussed with them, and the report was published, and uh, many countries have to get use of it. 
Then we work with the UNICEF uh, in implementing accessibility and inclusive education. UNICEF had more than 70 premises around the world and they wanted to be accessible, which is the second aim of the, the convention. So we worked together in, in that uh, project and uh, it was completed. Then we uh, had work with the UN Habitat. We went to New York, I mean to Nairobi, with, together with UNDISA, and we had three days uh, workshop to most of the uh, project managers at the UN Habitat. At that time, the accessibility was not in the radar of uh, UN Habitat. As uh, Victor was saying, that was almost the first time they heard about accessibility at the UN. Then at uh, Habitat. So then, you know, the things started and developing. We had also uh, a workshop with UNDISA at the World uh, Bank, World Bank Group in uh, Washington. We had, uh, they gathered more than 40 project managers who give, approve the loans to other countries, developing countries, and they, uh, we, have, we produce or we introduce to them uh, the accessibility issue in build environment, uh, mobility, and ICT at that time. And they, uh, they declare that they are going not to finance any project unless it is uh, with full accessibility. That is something we had done. We also uh, have a project with ABU, Radio Pacific uh, Broadcasting uh, Union, together with ITU, and the project was guiding on inclusive disaster risk redu reduction, early warning, uh, and accessible broadcasting. That was a very interesting project after the tsunami happened and uh, many, uh, earth, some earthquakes happened in Pakistan and in, in Nepal. And we uh, worked together with ITU and the, the ABU to develop a guideline for the countries uh, pre to the disaster, through the disaster, and after the disaster. Of course, all of you heard about the big uh, uh, conference which happened in Japan to, uh, uh, re related to the disaster in Quito, or Quito, which one of them? Quito in Japan, yes. So uh, this is part of some of the work that we had done internationally. Uh, our aim was to have an international organization, not only a local one. We depend financially on projects. We don't receive any charity or anything from anywhere. We depend on projects, so we have to work for a project and we have to find you know, different projects in different parts of the world. So that's why we created uh, Gates Country Representatives. And uh, the aim of that project, uh, of that uh, program, is to have country rep in every country around the world. If it's 190, well, well, let us do it in 30 years, but at least we we'll have to start. We started with 10 and 20 and 30, and uh, we are uh, almost now uh, running in, in, um, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in this program. So our country have to bring work to us and have to look for projects in Africa and Asia, Latin America. Uh, Okay, next thing we, we, we created uh, a newsletter called GAN. Uh, it is, uh, it's a newsletter related to accessibility only. All the information, the news that comes uh, related to accessibility in the last 10 years, we have it recorded in GAN. And we have more than 40,000 uh, participants, or I mean um, uh, people, uh, what they call it, uh, receiving it weekly, and uh, even uh, some ministries of uh, information and Ministry of Foreign Affairs take from our news. Okay, next we have uh, something we call it the International Certification of uh, Accessibility. Uh, uh, 
consumer building environment and this is a new program my colleague yes in the last uh, session had gave a pro a, a, about it then we uh, gates had a leading projects uh, in canada in bahrain norway uae and saudi arabia this is part of the big project that we handled for the last uh, still one minute or or more 30 seconds hi everybody raise your hands okay the last thing is uh, the, the the awards okay which is very important we should give everybody attended our this session an award what it is i don't know this i leave it to factor but we gave our award now 2011 to you and disa and this is uh, our friend akiko ito received it in new york and we gave 2014 our award to zero project so Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mukhtar, for your leadership and your vision. I think that we can see uh, a real need to continue to work together and invite people to uh, subscribe to the newsletter and also reach out if you want to represent Gates as a country representative as well. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is an architect that's really been leading the standards on accessibility uh, both in Europe and also in other parts of the world. Jose Luis Borrao is the head of the Built Environment and Accessibility Department at Fundación Onse. Um, I'd let him um, share with us, you know, how we can look to uh, philanthropy and civil society uh, to really provide technical support and expertise with governments as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor, <clears throat> for the presentation. Uh, well, uh, as Victor said, my name is Jose Luis Bora. I'm the head of the uh, Build Environment Accessibility Department, department into the, into the um, access, Universal Accessibility and area of the Fundación Once. I don't know if everybody knows what Fundación Once is. Fundación Once is born uh, in uh, 1988. This year we have our, our birthday. Uh, we, we are th uh, th 30 years old. Our, our mother company, our mother organization is ONCE, is the, the, um, the organization, the national organization for, this, for the Spanish blind people in Spain. And our main objective from Fundación ONCE, as ONCE, our, our mother um, as, uh, organization, they, they, they assume the, the needs of people with of, with uh, visual impairments or, or blind people, we will develop inclusion program for people with all kinds of disabilities, not only for, for blind people, but including uh, blind people, but and other people with other disabilities. Uh, of course, all these, these inclusion programs for people with disabilities require environments, products and services, physical and, virt and virtually accessible or well designed. Well, I, I'm an architect and I, and I, and I, nev I, uh, I never will say that a space, a city is accessible because I don't think there is uh, an example of, of accessibility because, uh, I, I, but I, I will always say that uh, a building is well designed. If a building is well designed, it will be accessible anyway, any of the way, okay? so. When we talk about accessibility in the built environment, we, we, we talk about accessibility for all. Everybody we have been talking in this, in this uh, conference, every, uh, any I, I, have, I have listened many many of, of the speakers uh, talking about uh, accessibility for every people, all the people. Uh, accessibility is not only for people with disabilities. Uh, it benefits everybody. Uh, all, yesterday I was presenting our, one of, of our projects about the ISO. We're working in um, of tu uh, accessible tourism. And <clears throat> we always say when we make tourism, almost everybody uh, are or uses uh, ch uh, wheels to move. Why? Someone, 
someone uses that wheels on, on, on their on their on their wheelchair, but others have the luggage with their with their trolleys, and uh, and other people goes with their pushing the the baby the baby the baby um, troller. A, a troller. Yeah. So everybody have have um, have wheels on it when they go making tourism. So uh, accessibility, of course, it benefits for everybody. Accessibility is expensive. Why? Accessibility, if you make accessible a project, uh, building a city from the beginning, it must not be more more expensive than, than, than when you design a an, an space that it is not accessible. So we have to choose between accessibility and between design. I don't think so. I think that accessibility always, as I, I said before, always will be uh, included inside a good design. A good design city, a good design product, a good design uh, building. But of course, it's not uh, possible to do it alone. Accessibility is one of the of the main of the legs of the of the objectives of the Fundación Once in Spain. Also, is the employment of people with with disability. We think uh, uh, the inclusion of people with disabilities in, inside the the, the the working the working environment is is essential. To, to, to get the, 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 the inclusion, the normalization, and of course uh, the environment, the built environment must be accessible. But we can't, we can't do it, I'm talking from, from, from Fundación Once, we can't do it alone. So what is need to make it happen? Of course, I say agreements, 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 alliance, collaboration, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing content, sharing time, sharing uh, resources, um, agreements, agreements. We can we can fund, we can fund, we can fund many many projects. But if we we don't consider this funding like an uh, uh, like an investment, and, and we think we from from. Fundación Once, one of, one of our success has been for that because we, we, we consider the funding like, a, like an investment. Uh, working together with, with many other partners, uh, working uh, together with other, with other um, society, uh, society actors to develop many programs. I'm going to show you some, some, of the, some, of the, some examples that, that have made uh, Spain, think, uh, thanks to the, to the work of the of Once Foundation and many other, many other um, actors in Spain, we can say here in Spain, I'm so proud to say that, because so many times we, uh, Spain upper, uh, appears in many statistics uh, in the in the in the back in the back of, of many of the statistics, but I am so proud to say that Spain uh, uh, is one of the of the leader in in, in, in accessibility in the built environment because what much uh, and, and the and the and the origin is for example this this example this collaboration we established uh, with Inserso Inserso is the Institute for the Elderly People and Social Affairs attached to the Ministry of Health social policy and equality uh, that was uh, an agreement that was um, focused on universal design uh, universal accessibility and design for all that was an agreement that was uh, took uh, 20 years from early 90s to 2011 uh, with more than 1700 uh, agreements uh, signed with different municipalities, with different universities, with different uh, entities, more than 800 beneficiary muni municipalities, near almost 2 million of euros of investments, including the, the investment or the participation of different uh, entities, the, the deportation of the investment of Once Foundation and the, and the Inserso. Uh, and we developed many or several accessible municipal planning. We made um, we make execution of works removing architectural and, ur and urban barriers. We made um, development of signage in buildings and urban and urban environment developments. We made we 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 started a, pro a program. To, to, inst to, install, uh, to install accessible taxis in many cities in Spain. Um, we made programs of accessibility on ICT, 
and uh, we made a lot of awareness, raising, training, and innovation for for the staff for the staff of the municipal municipalities. Uh, this this agreement is is is, is the largest public public and private, private partnership in the world uh, with uh, focused on universal universal accessibility. Uh, another agreement we made, and we are still working with that, with that agreement with uh, Fundación ACS. I don't know if uh, you know this this what ACS is. ACS is one of the most important building cons, uh, companies in Spain. Maybe you know his president. His president is Florentino Perez. You know him from because he is the president of Real Madrid, the soccer club, the, the next winner of the championship. Sorry for the Barcelona supporters, Manchester, and you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, Fundación ACS is investing since many years in historical buildings and cities, making them accessible. Uh, we are, we, Fundación ONCE, we are going with them. Of course, we are working training technical staff of the municipalities, architects, engineers, uh, training on accessibility, uh, developing technical guides, uh, compiling many manuals for, for them, for that architects, to make their city, their buildings, their, their municipal buildings accessible. Um, that's important, that's really important, training for the technical staff to know accessibility. Uh, with. Fundación Acceso, they, they, they also promote uh, the Queen Leticia Award on accessibility for the best practice, practices carried out by municipalities, depending on, the, on different population sites in Spain and Latin America. For example, another, another agreement we, we still maintain with Renfe and Adif. Renfe is the main railway operator in Spain. Adif is, manages railways, stations, and infrastructures. Uh, Again, one of our of our that 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 investing uh, that carries our our fund our funding is training for technical staff on accessibility. We 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 created together with with Adif uh, a customer service office on accessibility that attends every every of the railway stations in Spain, attending personalized all the all the travels with disability for elderly people, helping to to carry their luggage, helping to get into the trains, to get down to the trains, localizing their seats in the in the trains. Uh, we have been developing uh, research and development projects on accessibility implementation at the railway station, but also in the in the vehicles. And right now we are working uh, together with another public institu institution, the, Ro the, Ro the Royal Patronage on Disability, uh, an autonomous public body of, the, of Spain attached to the Ministry of Health, uh, Social Policy and Equality. And we are implementing with them an, university, an, an universal accessibility program uh, making and developing many, many, many projects like well, a road, we made a road show of, of an accessible, uh, intelligent, intelligent and sustainable house. It was inside a truck and we were uh, going through all of Spain. Uh, we reached last year more than 4,000 visitors to the, to the, to the road, road show. We are making standardization projects like the ISO, the ISO on accessible tourism. Uh, we are developing many other projects, educational projects, access accessibility to, to the workplace, and the, um, the traffic light is right now <laughs> making me finish. So, uh, just, that's important. Uh, we are making together with that Royal Patronage on Disability uh, the, the National Accessibility Plan until from, from 2018 to 2026. So we're defining and working all the action we have to implement here in Spain. Well, there in Spain on transport, relationship with public administration, urban planning and building, goods and services, and ICT. Conclusion, again, agreements, 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 collaboration. In this, in this, this you know, smart city, smart city, we are so frightened about, about the term smart cities. We, we talk better, much better, a smart human city. That's a term we have, we have made from, from Fundación ONCE. 
and there is no other way that to make on to put the, the the person in in the middle of the design process of the society of a city of a building thank you very much so we hear a clear call towards partnerships because this issue is complex multifaceted needs to be approached from multiple different sectors but also at different scales there's the local scale there's the national scale there's regional implementation plans and so we need a variety of different partners i'm excited to call upon my friend regina who also worked on the accessibility plan for the rio olympics she's also a professor uh, in architecture and an accomplished scholar in the field of accessible <coughs> urban design and accessible architecture. She'll talk to us about her experience from Rio de Janeiro. Regina Cohen, please, the floor is yours. It's very far for me to talk here because I have a barrier behind the, the table. But uh, I hope you are hearing me. Yes, I agree. Uh, we like to comment uh, on other persons, but we don't have many time. I was anxious I to show mistake. the reality of Brazil and mainly the, the reality of uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro. I work at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro with the Pro Access Group. Oh, it will be better? Yeah, I believe it would be better. And uh, uh, I didn't work only with the Olympic, uh, Victor, but uh, many projects. Uh, the Pro Access Group exists for more than 25, almost 30 years. And we have uh, here one of the collaborations. Monique is also like that. She has been our student, and now she's working with us together. Uh, it's difficult to to read there, but uh, José Luis was talking about smart cities. The architects are talking very much about smart cities. What are smart cities? Uh, we privilege the sidewalks, the walkability, and this is more important. Give the sidewalk for the the persons and not for the car. This is very important. Uh, you can. You want me to pass? No. And uh, I will show some of our work of the Pro Access Group. This was a picture of my doctor thesis. You can pass, please. Because uh, uh, talking about methodology, we did many checklists for urban spaces, schools, museums, and so on. You can pass. Uh, we were the first uh, university to introduce the discipline of accessibility, and we have four parts, the theoretical parts, the workshop, the students. It's inside the School of, of Architecture, and in the end, they need to do a project about accessibility. Each year, we choose a theme, a school, or something else. Please, I don't have too much time. Uh, it's big, and I don't want to hear the. And this is uh, an example of the workshop we did. Uh, it was the first one. This is the entrance of the School of Architecture. It's terrible, and it continues <coughs> terrible now. You can confess. Uh, and in the discipline of accessibility, uh, working with projects, uh, students become more aware uh, with the workshop and the projects. They find many difficulties and they open their mind, they become more aware. This was a, a work we did in the city of Salvador, an accessible house. Uh, it was the success of a fair 
uh, of construction and all the persons, all the architects and engineers went first for our stand and it was the success there. And uh, we did the workshop with the major of the city and uh, it was a very, very good project. And what we have in Brazil and mainly in the city of Rio de Janeiro is the problem of the habitation, the houses, the low-income people that don't have, uh, many persons are without a very good house and even without a house to live. And uh, with Monique, uh, we did a project for a person in a very small city of the state. And uh, if you look to the, the plant, you have many faces in red, the spaces that the person uh, on wheelchair couldn't enter, and only two red, uh, two green faces that the person could enter. And uh, the project, uh, look at for you can pass, uh, the accessible route, and, uh, and return the house like that. And what you used to say for our student, uh, it's not me, it's not many persons here with a disability that are disabled, the city, and the space itself are disabled and turn us more disabled. Uh, this was the work in museums. Uh, in the left side is a museum in Rio de Janeiro, historical museum. They are very difficult to, to change. Uh, I believe this is everywhere. And this is another museum, the pavement, uh, they did, did, this was the solution. Uh, to walk, uh, the walk through in a museum uh, with uh, persons with disability also. This is a very beautiful, beautiful uh, historical city, but I can't talk too much about Parachi. I can talk later. And this was a, an exposition I went in Australia, living in a sensory world. You can pass. And what is living in a sensory world? We have a, a tactile uh, map, map, maquette, maquette? Yeah. a plan uh, explaining in Braille, and a sensory uh, world is uh, very good for persons uh, with visual disability. This was in the museum in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, historical museum and only the statues in the garden could be touched. And here is in Sao Paulo, they are doing a very good work. In the right side is the football museum. They did uh, also uh, screens to touch and screen, uh, many, ex many good experience. And uh, we were worried also with the persons, uh, the deaf persons, and uh, we needed to have a person to, to make the sign language. And uh, for uh, the Olympic and Paralympic Games, this is a new museum in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and this is uh, many of you may know this is the future museum. It uh, has been in the media in many places and they made uh, many solutions. Rio Mais 20, uh, Rio Mais 20 was a very, Rio Plus 20, sorry, I speak, spoke in Portuguese, uh, but was the best uh, consultants. We worked together with United Nations and uh, they liked it very much. It was the best uh, conference of United Nations with solutions for all the accessibility, physical communication, information, and they told that after the convention, this was the first uh, conference uh, completely accessible. 
And this was the work we did with the Olympic and Paralympic Committee. It was not easy, we show, but uh, it was standards. We needed to compare standards from all around the world and uh, make one for the Rio Olympic Games. And now uh, our project, oh. <laughs> But it's important, the guide is very important. We are doing a guide, an accessible virtual guide. Uh, this is Maracanã, it's in the guide, but it's also a project we did for the World Cup 2004. This was a, a research in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And uh, many beaches in Brazil, Brazil have uh, many beautiful beaches. They are doing many solutions. And this is me. Now uh, we are working in the Olympic with the torch, carrying the torch in the day uh, before the opening ceremony. We are working with the concept, concept uh, smart cities, universal accessibility, but also with emotional accessibility, what we feel. I was very happy in that picture. And accessibility is also for me that to be happy in all spaces, in all cities, and with uh, everybody. Thank you very much, Regina. Very comprehensive in terms of the impact. Very comprehensive in terms of the impact that you have led. And I personally found the documents that you shared, the methodology for accessibility, very useful. I've asked the Zero Project to post all of the presentations onto the website so that the audience can download these presentations and contact the speakers for any other follow-ups uh, that might be needed. Um, one of the things that I've also very intrigued by is I see a lot of friends in the audience, like Hector Minto from Microsoft and uh, Hiroshi and others that bring a lot of experience in terms of technology as well as leveraging uh, emergency responses for people with disabilities. And I think that we have to think about a lot of the changing demographics and the changing roles that governments have. But nonetheless, we ultimately all occupy cities. And one city that I've worked with very closely has been the city of Dubai. So I'm very honored to bring my good friend, Dr. Salem Shafei, who has been leading the effort to make Dubai the number one most accessible city in the world. Uh, but I've been, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Shafei, we've spoken for the last few years about how important it is to create indicators, standards, and really manage this process of a transformation. Dubai is undergoing uh, an urban transformation that is holistic and integrated. Uh, it's been, it was a real honor to sort of work with you guys on the Dubai Disability Strategy. Now that you're a couple years into the strategy, can you give us an overview as to how we can, we can look at management of this urban transformation beyond just the political commitments and beyond just allocating of budgets? How do you really supervise and how do you really manage such a holistic transformation? We look forward to your interventions. Thank, Thank you. you, Victor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure being here, and I would like to start by thanking the Zero Project for offering us such a brilliant and dynamic global platform to discuss inclusion uh, among some of the best experts and leaders in the world. Uh, I'm actually here just to give you a quick overview of the work that's been, been done in Dubai Emirates in the past uh, two and a half years in the area of inclusion. Um, so the work that I'm going to discuss here was done in over 10 months, so I've been told you spent one minute for, for a month. So I hope I can, I can give it some justice. Uh, and I hope I can see the, the screen from here, otherwise I'll have to stand up on the podium. 
Uh, Dubai Emirate actually is one of the seven Emirates that uh, makes up the Federation of United Arab Emirates. You may be aware of that. Dubai is the most populous uh, Emirate uh, amongst uh, all the other seven Emirates. Uh, while Dubai's size, physical size and population size may not be quite large from a, from a global perspective, uh, we have about 2.8 million people living in the whole Emirate. Uh, what's fascinating is Dubai attracts about 15 million tourists every year. And I think that puts Dubai uh, number four or five in the world. So that's, uh, that's by itself uh, a very important economic uh, news, but also it brings a lot of pressure uh, to urban, urban planners and urban, uh, those who are in charge of making sure that urban development is, uh, is uh, in the right place. I'll have to excuse myself to stand because I don't think I can see the screen very well from this angle. So I'll just go stand and stand here. there. That's, that's why I'll just go there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, what you have up there, we have uh, the, the, the vision that drives our work that uh, we're doing currently in Dubai. Uh, we've moved uh, about two and a half years ago when Victor came to Dubai and started working with the Dubai government on uh, putting together the Dubai, uh, Dubai disability strategy. Uh, I think the time when Victor came in, uh, the old medical or charity uh, model was intact, and most of the thinking at that time was uh, inclusion meant uh, that we have to offer uh, some scattered activities here and there that were not enshrined or uh, well thought about as a right base. So Dubai now is following a right-based uh, approach to its, uh, to its development of uh, inclusion and inclusion efforts. Uh, therefore, uh, everything we do is, is based on rights-based uh, and nothing like nothing more than that, and nothing less than that. All right. So uh, I would don't want to bore you with reading uh, the vision statement, but clearly some of the key words is is right-based and uh, and barrier-free uh, environment. All right. So uh, let's move on. And so uh, the work we worked in recently uh, uh, was manifested in something called the Dubai Universal Accessibility Strategy. The Dubai Universal Accessibility Strategy is a very unique project by the virtue of its nature. Uh, it's a per perhaps one of the very few projects that was conducted worldwide that focuses on the entire territory of, of a, a city or a, or a country or a state. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, I think this project that we, we worked on was quite unique. It actually covers the two most prominent domains of what uh, we keep hearing here, the, the inclusive urban development, and that, of course, the built environment and the transportation. So we all live and move uh, in our daily lives in these two spheres, the built environment of all its different types and also the transportation and mobility aspects. Uh, the third leg of accessibility that was not ignored but was not part of this particular project was the information, te information uh, accessibility and that, of course, had to do with the ICT and other parts. Another important uh, part of this project is that we've looked at this entire, uh, entire uh, accessibility chain, and I think this was emphasized by two or three of my colleagues. We've not left out any, any aspects of that, so if there's any breakage in any link of this accessibility journey, then you risk uh, hampering inclusion and hampering opportunity, equal opportunity. Therefore, uh, it's very, very important and it's paramount important that we pay attention to the entire accessibility chain from one end to the other. All right. Uh, the project that we worked on went through a number of phases. It started by uh, looking at the existing conditions and identifying and analyzing the gaps that were there, and those gaps, of course, included all aspects that come to mind. We've looked at regulations and legislation, so identified some of the gaps in those. We've also looked at existing uh, technical practices, uh, awareness, uh, and so on and so forth. So we spent about two and a half good months of looking into what's missing in our practices, in our, in our way of looking at accessibility, and that was, for us, that was a platform for understanding where do we stand now, and so therefore that was uh, an important. We've also looked at some of the international best practices. We know that the world has some very good practices, uh, so we spent a good amount of time looking at what's happening in the world in terms of progress in this field. 
uh, that was um, that was a very fascinating thing because we, you know, we explored uh, things that we never were aware of before, uh, and that of course gives us a lot of room for uh, cutting some of the unnecessary time wastage in this field. Now, then we moved to phase three, in which we started to filling uh, in the gaps that we found in the first phase. Uh, and as I said, these gaps were primarily in key areas like uh, regulations. So we uh, developed the Dubai Universal Design Code, uh, which again includes both uh, built environment and transportation domains. Uh, but also we drafted uh, a local bylaw in which we uh, enable uh, concerned government entities for the first time in the history of Dubai to be able to fully enforce the code, not only that, but also to sanction penalties against those who do not uh, oblige or do not follow what's in the code. Um, uh, the fourth important part of this work was the development of the Dubai Universal Accessibility Strategy. And, uh, so this is the roadmap. The Dubai government, His Highness Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed, the Crown Prince of Dubai, who leads this effort, has given everybody in the Emirate of Dubai uh, to the year 2020 to uh, turn everything around and make sure that we don't miss anything. We make sure that we, and that's why P Victor said we, we, our dream is to become the most accessible city in the world. Now we understand that's not an easy job, but we need to set some very high targets for ourselves. So that was the third part. And then of course, the fifth uh, leg of all this work was, uh, to my in mind, one of the most important work one of the key gaps that we found in Dubai was this lack of technical knowledge among the engineers, among the planners, the interior designers, architects. Uh, unfortunately, many of, this, many of the academic programs in the country don't expose those, prof those future professionals to, to much training. So when they go to the field, they, uh, they do face a problem of understanding. Therefore, you know, we wanted to close this gap. Now, this is an ongoing activity. Training does not stop. Uh, so we have continuous, like, uh, two, uh, about three weeks ago, we had uh, something called the, the Universal Design Week in Dubai, a big event in which everybody from uh, different parts of society came, and, uh, and I, was, I had the privilege of going there. This was hosted by the Dubai Municipality, one of our key, uh, key players in turning things around. Uh, so key, some, of the key important, some of the key important inputs of uh, outcomes of the strategy uh, shown there. I see my red light is already up. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, what's important is that uh, we have two problems at hand. We have new development, and so new development might be a bit easier because we're dealing with new development that can be controlled through sanctioning of enforcement of the new code. But the biggest problem we have is uh, in the existing city. Dubai is quite large physically. Uh, there are some very excellent examples. I don't know how many of you have been to Dubai, but for instance, the Dubai Metro is is a brilliant example. <laughs> All right, I think I, okay, I just, this is the last one if you don't mind. Okay, so the retrofitting uh, as that I mentioned is, is the most difficult part. So what we've done is, uh, you know, 2020 is just tomorrow. It's very, very close. So what we've done, we've tried to look at the, some of the key priority sectors in the city. And you, as you may see in that lower uh, box there, we've defined uh, 10 uh, key areas. And this includes, of course, inclusive education, so all educational building facilities from kindergarten all the way to university, uh, health facilities, religious facilities, justice, like the police station, the courts, uh, tourism being very vital for Dubai, and so on and so forth, also recreation and parks. Uh, so we work very closely. We have a, a, an officially, uh, officially announced committee uh, that includes representatives from key government entities, lead entities. We work with the private sector, we work for, with non-governmental sector, and we call those partners and uh, we develop alliances with them. Uh, so we use that as a platform to do this major retrofitting that is about to happen. So uh, our pledge is that Dubai will become one of the most accessible, most of one of the most accessible cities in the world, hopefully by, by that date or a little beyond. Thank you very much and thank you. Dr. Salem, you gave us a comprehensive look at how to integrate various aspects of a city through transportation, 
to public education, to the infrastructure. I want to commend you for your leadership because this does show how systematic and sequential progress can take place. Um, and I also think that there's a lot to, to continue to, to learn and to share also on a regional level. So as we're looking at best practices, and as we're looking at how different regions can work together, I know that Saudi Arabia has an ambitious plan, the Vision 2030, to include accessibility. I know that in the Asia Pacific region, there's a lot of effort. So I think that what the goal of our discussion today is, what are the continuous practical steps that need to be taken? And then what are the, what are the ways, what, what are some of the, the, the key wishes that each one of the panelists would like to see? What are some of the key things that you think we need to put into place urgently in order to reach this goal uh, by the 2030 timeline? So I'll, I'll ask the, the, the panelists to think about that. What key wish do we want to see? But before we do that, I want to invite my friend Elizabeth Maria Francini to speak to us about the really innovative work that she's doing in Italy and how she's brought uh, an approach from a foundation to a sustainable uh, and continuous improvement um, on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I have to summarize 10 years of my work in 10 minutes, so I'll do my best. <laughs> this is Luca. It's an aerial view of an historical center that is a challenge. Um, I don't think we are going to be like Dubai, the most inclusive city in the world, but we are doing our best. We are um, an Italian banking foundation that works mainly on the province of Lucca. We are, we are part of the European Foundation Center in Brussels, and we are part of the Disability Thematic Network and the founder of the League of Historical and Accessible Cities. Um, a group of foundations that work in different cities in Europe to make historical centers more inclusive and accessible. So, um, just to give you an idea, as uh, my colleagues were saying before, you cannot do it alone. So this is the local network that is an ensemble of uh, public and private bodies, uh, association of persons with disabilities, universities, uh, and a lot of people that are working on accessibility in our small town. Just to give you an idea of what we have done, um, I made, we made a, a small video. That is an animated video where you can see that we have created ramps, uh, um, made the new pavements. Uh, everything has made to respect cultural heritage that is our value. Thank you. And we respected the idea that what we are doing is for everybody, not only for disabled people. And here you have some example that is nothing that we invented, but we have just done it in our particular area. And that's why for us uh, is a, a sign of moving, because uh, in an historical center that has more than 2,000 years of history, it's not easy to move uh, even a stone, I can assure you. can see the classical pedestrian crossing that become easier with the traffic light that gives uh, audio signals for visually impaired people that can cross without having problems. <laughs> and sometimes it seems a, li a little thing, but it's not. Or creating a new pavement that is good for a woman that has high wheels and a um, mother with a child. system in the historical center that could be useful for blind people because we couldn't use the classical lodges in the historical center. So we decided together with the, uh, 
the cultural heritage uh, uh, competent office that we could use these metal bars in the center. And this is a special route that we made on the walls, and I'll tell you something more later, that visually impaired people with a special mark can visit uh, our walls in an autonomous way and receiving messages and information uh, with the Bluetooth. And this is our cathedral, and uh, it's also the headquarters of uh, the foundation in that wonderful old palace. It's not the best solution, but it's a beginning for us, and that was important. Thank you. <laughs> I can move on with this. Uh -oh. What am I doing? Okay. So the other thing was important for us is, well, is that uh, sometimes you can find information, but you don't have a, a website that says everything about accessibility. So now we are mapping all the historical center because at the moment the website is only on the routes we realized. But at the same time we are mapping it to, see, to show that you can reach all the historical center even if it's not everything accessible. We are mapping the center and this is going to be the website when we finish the work. And this is what I was telling you before. The University of Pisa, um, the engineers, uh, studied this very special smart cane together with a local uh, um, aircraft and they uh, reduced um, an electronic device to put inside the, smart, the, the cane and that can uh, speak with the Bluetooth and give to the person the way to move autonomously on the walls. So this for us is very important because it's the main monument of our city. Then we have two uh, multisensorial parts inside the botanical garden that is a very important place for us too, where we have uh, monumental trees and seeds and special plants. And then in these years we developed a lot of collaborations for inclusive playgrounds for the sign language in our news uh, on local TV. Um, we have a podistic uh, um, um, initiative that takes place each year that has uh, um, a route that is accessible for everybody. Then we have the University of Pisa that developed with, uh, together with us a goalkeeper electronic one that is uh, usable from disabled people that can play soccer with the other guys, and then we made the training courses regarding the accessibility of websites for professionals, and we also gave um, three uh, scholarships to persons with disabilities to participate to two editions of a course of Dublin and speaking. And then we thought that it was important also to create something on cultural accessibility in our town. So we made uh, two exhibitions inclusive regarding photography and experimenting also the link with students that are producing 3D at the school and robotics. So to let them understand how blind people feel when they touch or they have to feel with the touching the pieces that they produce at school. And that was very interesting to see how the students were very um, empathic and needed to listen the experience of the people. And then last year we had another experience that was uh, more inclusive because we had not only the 3D printed but also a uh, sculpture, braille text, uh, um, um, a video with subtitles, with sign language, and a sensory platform that transforms sounds in vibration for deaf people. And so I think I said a little bit more or less everything. And these are the professionals that are helping me in this uh, journey. And thank you, everybody. I think I've been. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that insightful view. I think that every city presents its unique position, a unique historical, cultural, economic, and political landscape. But in every city, there is an opportunity to identify and remove barriers. There is an opportunity to build partnerships. And there is an opportunity to be proud of the city that respects all its citizens. 
Each one of our presenters today showed us just that, how a city can give dignity and can give rights and can give an opportunity for all of the citizens to benefit from and contribute to the prosperity of that city. One of the themes that we've worked a lot on is this idea of cities for all. As the president of Gates, I have been wanting to continue to work with experts, technical experts throughout the world, and develop a community of practitioners. So I would like to invite you all to reach out to me and to Gates so that we can map this accessibility professionals from Luca, from Rio de Janeiro, from Ecuador, from Dubai, and that we can exchange through this community of practice these experiences like we are today at the Gates Forum. We can also do that through this network that we've built, the Disability Inclusive and Accessible Urban Development Network that has presentations every two weeks by experts in this field. So I would like to use today's forum not just as a meeting, but almost as the beginning of a new partnership. I would like to make sure that Federico and Catherine and Tracy, um, that you guys have the sign-up sheet. Can you raise your hand if you did not sign up to the sign-up sheet? Because we'd like to send you the presentations. So raise your hand if you have not signed up. Only one person? The rest of you signed up? Two people, one in the back? Three people? Four people. Okay, so there's four people that have not signed up. So Tracy will make sure that we get your contact info. Five people up here on the front as well. Six people, okay. I feel like I'm at an auction. <laughs> okay, so just raise your hand and Tracy uh, will come, or Catherine will come get your sign-up sheet. So we'll invite you to the DIU network. We'll invite you to learn more about the work that Gates is doing. Um, and we'll invite you to continue to share these best practices. But I want to turn the attention now to the audience as well as to the panelists. This is an open question. What one thing do you think, and obviously this, this issue is multi-sectoral and she's challenging on multiple scales. But from your perspective, in a very brief way, what is the key missing piece that we should be focusing on in order to ensure a more sustainable approach to accessibility in the built environment? And I want to ask this in light of the 2030 strategy in light of the sustainable development goals and in light of these big transformations that we're seeing with aging populations, with the advent of technology and artificial intelligence and, and smart cities. What are, the, what are the most important things that you think we should be focusing on so that we don't miss the chance of building a more inclusive urban future. So does anybody want to jump in? Yes, please, Regina. Do we have the other phone? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, Victor, uh, I have three things uh, that uh, we are needing in mainly in the city of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, everybody told about the interchange, agreement, connections. I see many Latin America countries and the city of Rio de Janeiro and me personally uh, am living a very special moment in the city. I am now in the uh, 
Permanent Commission of the Municipality of Rio de Janeiro. And this is a very important, uh, we begin the end of the last year. Uh, I knew we were talking with uh, Monique. Uh, we have two uh, institutions, one is of engineers, and now we have the architects uh, with, their, with our own institution. And the architects, uh, the, the, I was elected the titular uh, counselor of the, the architect and urbanism uh, organism of the city, of the state. And uh, now I succeeded to create also a, a, an accessibility commission. And it's beginning just now. We have a lot of things to do and also to fiscalize all the buildings in the city of Rio de Janeiro, in the city and in the state. The state, we have uh, almost 100 uh, municipalities. And I just want to say that uh, this agreement and interchange, I want to be together and to propose uh, for Gates to uh, make an agreement. I don't know how to talk more about that. And, Thank you. And uh, I, I believe I am in, and also in the university, I'm part of the Forum of Accessibility and Inclusion. So the three positions I am now, uh, we can do many things together with Gates and uh, for the city and for the state of Rio de Janeiro, uh, this can be very important now. Because Rio passed for many events, the World Cup, the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, I don't like to talk uh, bad of my city and my state, but I need to confess that we lost two big chances to become uh, uh, really uh, universal cities and states and a country for all. And now we need to, to look for another strategy and another way. And so I want to talk with you and sure. see what we can do together. Thank you, Regina. We know that when a country hosts the Paralympic Games, and these large events, there is a, there's a strong commitment to accessibility because you cannot bid for the Olympics without ensuring universal design and accessibility. And we've seen the legacy in, for example, in Barcelona and in Spain, a, a large legacy from some of these initiatives. So it's important to continue to build on this, uh, this initiative. So we'd be happy to explore that. But for the other speakers, in a very short way, what do you think is missing? Do we need more training of architects? For example, in Brazil, there is 5,000 municipalities, and there's an association of 1.2 million engineers and architects, but yet they don't have any training on accessibility. So you have a huge gap of technical skills and knowledge where you have engineers and architects graduating without the technical experience of accessibility. Any other speakers want to talk about a specific gap that we should be investing in or focusing our energy on? Yes, Victor. Um, for me, in just a few words, I would say people. That's, that's the link. That's the gap. That's the gap for the architects, that's the gap for the designers. Of course, as you were, you were saying, Victor, training for architects, training for engineers in, in accessibility, but I go far away from that. People, when we think on people, when we, we think designing, uh, we th when we think people, when we are designing, we'll get, that's, that's the gap, that's the really gap. Uh, when we are a public administration of a city, when we think of what 
citizens really need. I don't know. I, 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 I'm going to speak again about uh, this, the smart city concept. I'm really sure that many of the, of the APPs that many municipalities are developing, many citizens don't need them. So let's think or let's give to the, to the citizens, to the people, what they really demand. And when we, when we, design, uh, when, when we design everything thinking of that needs, we'll, give, we'll, we'll obtain uh, a, a, an accessible, an, a, a good designed environment, a good designed city, uh, a good, an accessible city. Somebody else from the, the audience? I mean, many of you in the audience are looking at these issues as well. I know that we have uh, a lot of apps that are looking at accessibility, crowdsourced apps from Japan and from the US. I know that we're looking at issues of, uh, like you said, smart cities. We have an initiative uh, with G3ICT that's called Smart Cities for All. Smart Cities for All has developed after rigorous consultations a toolkit that will help cities be more digitally inclusive. So for example, we know that in the next two years, $2 trillion will be invested by cities in upgrading their technology infrastructure. But there's a huge risk that these investments will leave persons with disabilities out. On a global survey, we identified that over 60% of respondents of smart city experts believe that smart cities are failing persons with disabilities. And only 18% of the survey respondents could identify one smart city, uh, could identify any smart city that was including ICT accessibility standards. So there's a huge disconnect in terms of awareness, not only on the physical accessibility, what needs to be done in terms of building codes, land use, permitting, procurement, but also the digital side of those investments, as well as cities are deploying services, uh, digital services, everything from citizen participation portals to uh, obtaining information like paying a parking ticket or providing you know, information about public transportation and such. How do we ensure that all these, the, the public realm um, is, is fully inclusive and accessible? Those are the questions that we need to, to work on together and find the kinds of partnerships uh, and resources to be able to have a meaningful conversation, not just about advocacy, but also the technical skills required to sustain the progress uh, day by day. Uh, President Barack Obama appointed me to the US Federal Access Board which is a regulatory agency in the United States that oversees accessibility policy. And one of the things that I was told, and I think is relevant for all of our work, is that we must think about this work as radical incrementalism. Radical because these are large changes from the status quo, but they must go step by step. So there has to be a way to have the legal structures in place, which we have, and then the regulations, which provide the technical standards and guidelines, the enforcement mechanisms, the way to educate and inform civil society, the way to hold practitioners accountable, as well as the private and public sector, to have a way to put a complaint mechanisms in place, and also to have partners across academia, um, as well as the, the philanthropic partners that can really help strengthen civil society's role in really being uh, a partner with, with governments that are trying to make these changes. So I think that there are prog there's progress that we're making. 
but we do have to maintain sort of this focus uh, and meet more often and exchange these practices. So we do hope that you'll reach out to us and we will write you all. If anybody still hasn't signed up to the list, raise your hand or make sure you get the information. Okay, so you, oh, there's one person in the back, Tracy, uh, on the right side. One person right over there, Tracy? Sure. So you'll get information from this session today so that you can continue to be engaged. Are there any questions to our, to our panelists from the audience? Yes. Ahmed. Hi, Victor. Uh, my question is uh, to Regina. Uh, I could not help myself not notice, noticing that you are more focused on, on the disability you have, which is something we usually face with, with non-expertise in the field. Uh, is there any, uh, I don't know, is there any consideration for other disabilities in your programs? Yes, for sure. Uh, I was waiting for this question. No, we don't work only with the physical disability. Also, and now uh, in the municipal council, all the organisms that I talk that I, I'm working, we we think of the blind, uh, the persons with visual disability, the deaf and the autism and the intellectual the Down syndrome and other other persons. But I, as an architect, uh, I work with the project. But I need to be, uh, to think on the tactile pavement. Uh, these are solutions for the projects. But uh, we also think on the other disabilities. I couldn't uh, work for more than 25 years and think only on wheelchairs. Sorry, but the presentation just shows the... I mean. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. And the presentation was 90 slides. I, I needed to reduce uh, maybe the main... <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, uh, when we are, my name is Bhaskar, I am the second vice president of CASE. So when we are discussing about the smart city, I think this is very important to talk about the accessible ICTs. ICT can make the city more accessible. So, and, and also the city should be accessible for all, um, all types of people with disabilities, such as neurodevelopment disability, visual impaired, sign language user, and of course for the uh, physical disability. So we need a city which will be inclusive and universally designed. Um, uh, and as new urban agenda is um, in Malaysia, we just seen the discussion. So hopefully the uh, gates can lead this discussion to the different forum. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Shankar, and um, this question is, anyone can answer, but it's uh, more specific to uh, Salim uh, Al-Fashai. Um, firstly, super congratulations on the audacious goal that you've set up for yourselves. Um, I was actually curious to understand, because uh, inclusion kind of comes in two forms. One is, uh, uh, you know, the work that you're doing to make infrastructure and transport uh, accessible, but um, how uh, how are you planning to uh, to make uh, the mindsets uh, you know more inclusive? Because uh, especially because of the stigma that that prevails. Thank you very much for this uh, very important question. I, th I think this is a very central question that you've come up with, my friend. Um, of course, uh, I think we all recognize that barriers come in different forms. And they don't have to be so visible, physically present, so to be to be hindering uh, inclusion, uh, to the know mindset barriers and the way we perceive disability and people with disability can be more dangerous 
than the physical barriers on the ground. We, uh, we've recognized this in Dubai Emirate, and, um, and as, I, as I tried to say in my statement earlier, is that shifting the mindset uh, is not as simple as shifting or removing uh, the physical barriers, but we're working on that. There are programs that we've putting in place uh, working very closely with the educational system to start with younger age children. We've noticed, and I think this is very prevalent to the rest of the world, when people with disability are, are present and, and, and integrated in real life, in real settings, that really uh, reduces so much of the stigma because then there is this interaction, there is this understanding firsthand. And one reason why I think uh, uh, this stigma is quite high in some places is because of the sheer of separation. You know, when you separate people with disability from the mainstream community, you don't allow the, the community to, 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 to understand the situation well, and therefore you have this stigma perpetuating in the mind. So yeah, there are programs uh, of all types, actually. There are very soft, subtle uh, programs that we've adopted in Dubai, working, as I said, closely with the school system, with families, uh, NGOs, and, and other, other entities. But also there are very visible uh, public campaign awareness uh, under the umbrella of, of the, this initiative called uh, My Community, a City for All. Uh, so we periodically uh, come out in the media and have uh, different avenues in social media to discuss that and try to. So it's, it's a longer journey, I think. It's a much longer journey uh, than, than removing the physical barrier, but certainly that has to be there. And I go back to the, the very important question that was raised by my uh, dear colleague uh, and friend, uh, Victor. And I, I think from my very humble experience in this field, I think the two, uh, two most important cornerstones in really making a change in the world, I think, is awareness. And by that, I mean total awareness, the philosophy of inclusion, and the philo philosophy of equality, uh, uh, one city for all, one life for all. You know, you can't have dual tracks and then you say, well, I'm inclusive. That, there is wrong, something wrong with your awareness. So awareness is very important. Awareness by whom? By everybody. By everybody. And the other one is knowledge. Once you have good, proper awareness, up, you know, up-to-date awareness, and you have good knowledge, and the challenge with knowledge is that knowledge keeps recreating itself with the new technology, with the change that we have in the world, so I think if we focus on these two things, and I, we've tried so hard in the Dubai strategy to bring these two, uh, it's not just about the good code. It's raising awareness and having this continuously uh, upgraded and enhanced and enhanced knowledge. So if these two come together, everything else can be resolved, believe me. You know, some, we've noticed that some people say, well, you know, financial resources could be a problem. If you have innovative ideas, you have knowledge on how to, to bring in. We had one workshop in which we brought in some people who, who had we were very skilled in, in fundraising and understanding on how can we bring in the money to really achieve this target. They come up with brilliant ideas. Unless they are given the platform, unless they are inv invited in to think on how can we best do that, you will not be able to achieve it. So yes, work on it, but keep this in mind, raising awareness and really having that knowledge up to date, up to par. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albarita. You have the final question, and then I'll ask the panelists to each just give a concluding thought and maybe even give us a homework assignment. What can we do starting today to make a change? What can we do to make this issue move forward faster? Okay, Marina, last question. Um, my, my question is, um, we've spoken about, of course, the need for awareness and, and the partnerships that are being made, and in some cases we've heard of royal patronage, but what I'd like to know about are what successful models are there for helping those uh, companies, building, transport companies, whatever it is, in retrofitting. It's not just about new buildings, but it's about those who Want to, want to adapt, want to have accessible spaces, and aren't necessarily in a position to do it. What successful models are there? Well, for example, uh, in the, the model of agreement we made with the, with INSESO, the, the Institute of, of Elderly People and, and Social Affairs, it was to, to remove 
uh, existing barriers, not only for 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 um, uh, for new buildings. In Spain, we have we have a construction uh, construction code that began to be to be a mandatory a mandatory um, document on 2010, and um, there there were there were included some some questions regarding accessibility and every. Every new building that is built from uh, nine, uh, from 2010, uh, it has to comply with all the requirements. And we had from uh, a, a, a date that from 2010 to for the December the 4th of 2017, so the, uh, the last uh, last month, last December. Every place should be adapted. I want to say every place, every urban place, every uh, every public uh, building should must should be adapted to these requirements in the in the building code. Of course, the fourth the fourth of December passed, and everything is is, is like that. So. In many cases, the, 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 the problem is, is the, 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 the financial the, the, the financial aspect, but uh, from the governments, from the, from the governors in, in every level, in national level, on regional level, on local level, must develop policies to help different, we say we're talking about um, companies, we're talking about municipalities, but, but what, what can we say about um, I don't know how to say in English, uh, of a building, when, when, a, when a building of, 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 of when a, I don't know, community of, of, of people living in, in a house, house, you know, when they, yeah, that's it, in a housing, when, when they have no lift, no elevator in the, in the building, and they have to, to put one elevator. Who, who must pay that? So there, there must have be, there must have be, de, there must be developed policies at a local level, at, at, national level to help uh, companies, communities to take, to, to take away these, 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 these actions. Uh, what, what's your name, my, What's your name? Marina. Uh, is a very great question. Because I believe uh, all the countries represent here what is a successful model. Uh, in Brazil, the same as in Spain, and in many countries, we have many good standards, many good laws. We had, uh, uh, this year, we needed to be with the municipal mobility plan uh, ready for the municipality of more than 25,000 uh, people. And only 40 municipalities, we have 5,000. And uh, we have uh, a recent law that also obliged, we need to be completely accessible this year. We, we know that we want. And uh, it's difficult to know what's the successful model. We need to discuss, but uh, not discuss and make more laws, more standards, and we need to find the strategy and together. Because uh, I believe this is all around the world, not only in Latin America, Europe has has the, your problems, you have your problems. The United States, that I lived there for four months in a university, they were revising the ADA, the, the standards of the United States. So it's not the best. Uh, everything say, oh, United States is the best. We need to find a solution. I'm, I'm become frustrated, not uh, uh, that I can't answer, but I, I look for it, for this answer. Sorry. It's a very good question. Perfect. So, Marina, your question is excellent because who is going to support, what are the financial incentives 
or disincentives to create the investments required to change the built environment. I think on the side of digital accessibility, the costs are much lower because you can build in accessible features and standards in the procurement of the technology. You just make sure that you spend the money in a way that achieves accessibility standards. But I think that we can also look at models where public investments cannot be made if they fail to take into account accessibility and ways to ensure, for example, in Brazil, Tribunal de Contas de Union, which is the, the national auditing agency for the government, to ensure that there's a process or mechanism, because every city and every country has public sector funds, and those funds should not be used in a way that exclude people. So can we create mechanisms in our countries so that at least the funding that is being used does not perpetuate the kind of barriers that continue to limit and exclude and marginalize the elderly and people with disabilities and so many other people? How do we align those efforts? Now we'll do the last comment by the panels. And so what homework assignment do you guys have for us? And what concluding thought do you have so that we can move forward and move this issue ahead? Fernando. Well, uh, in my case, it's kind of different. I, I, I saw all these good practices, and they are like well-developed in, in specific spaces, in specific times. And in my case, uh, when I work with countries and when I work with international organizations, it, it is kind of hard because to find a consensus could be pretty hard. But I would like to emphasize into something that there's a right to the city. And, yes. and under this criteria of the right to the city, we have, to, we, we, we have the right to, to ask for our authorities, local, national, regional, international authorities, to fulfill this right. So it is a key factor to understand that. And I would like to emphasize on the idea that uh, we have to strengthen the governance mechanisms and we have to, to strengthen the monitoring mechanisms, as long as this is all right. So one uh, pretty big, uh, uh, how, how do you say, what is it, lesson? Lesson. Yeah, one pretty important lesson that we get through the, through the new urban agenda, and especially after the work that we developed at the Work Urban Forum uh, on, the last week, on the last week, is that there's always the chance to include this as a mainstream topic. Yeah. So one, uh, we have to work uh, pretty hard with our government and, and with uh, regional and international organizations to create a, a straight position in order to secure the fulfillment of this right. Once we get to mainstream this idea, we will be able and it will be easier to get mechanisms for the implementation. There will be an awareness, uh, not only a political awareness, but also a real, a real awareness in order to join these technical and political spheres. So then we will be able to get resources, then, we, then it will be easier to, to get uh, to better projects, to, to in, into better policies. So, so Fernando, your suggestion is that we claim our rights to the city, that we, we have, have a claim. clear statement that we, we, we claim the right to the city, and then mobilize the technical and sort of political commitments to move those forward, right? The city is ours, so we have okay. to fight. Thank you, Fernando. Next. Um, I say that we must consider the city like a body, like a body where his skin must be adapt and modify what uh, inside, what is inside, what uh, we must to thinking about the city like uh, layers, a network of layers, because uh, as keep the transport, uh, public transport, the bicycle roads, um, a lot of things in the city, but the accessible route is not considered too much in the city, and the universal accessi accessibility must to be considered 
another layer, the layer of the people that's claimed uh, his right, his possibility of circulation in the city to travel to one point to another. Um, I think that universal accessibility can no um, stay only in the building, uh, but must come through the city, like a layer, like the skin that must be adapted. Thank you. Next. Uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize on uh, the importance of accessibility as a mean of uh, uh, a major link to in the in the in the uh, in poverty reduction in the world as part of it now uh, I would like to vector to add many African countries, many poor countries, who are not being uh, touched or never been uh, in the road map for accessibility. We tried in gate to make an agreement with the African Union of disability based in Addis Ababa. There is more than 100 cities in Africa, and they are huge cities, and then the accessibility is not there. Uh, when we talk now about smart cities, yes, we have in Europe, we have in America, North America, we have in Japan, but so many poor countries have no, not even heard about this term. Uh, in Asia and Africa and um, some Latin American, as you said. So I would like to emphasize on in, in giving the, the poor countries, especially Africa, a big share in our effort for accessibility. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, closing thoughts or homework assignment. Oh, I don't know what to talk more, okay. <laughs> but uh, we talked about smart cities, and in the last uh, last year, I saw uh, books, cities for people, cities for pedestrians, and everything of this is smart cities, and uh, Many uh, countries, the concept of a smart cities, they are reducing. I'm seeing projects uh, reducing the the space for the auto, for the, the public transport, and give it in the sidewalk for people, and uh, taking the transport and walking, making the VLT like in Rio, uh, the high speed transport and uh, city for people, smart cities. We need to think uh, and to, to get ahead. Thank I don't you. Know. Thank you. Sorry. Dr. Oh, Salah, you want this? any assignment for the audience? Things that they need to take home with them? Yes. Okay, just, just uh, continue with your, with your explanation. I, I would like only to say, and I, and want and, and and I'll try not to mention the world disability. And I'll try not to mention the world accessibility. I try not to mention the world's people with disability. I think a city is a place where the citizens where the citizens live, where people lives. A city won't be any way. Can't a, a, a city can't be smart. A city can't be intelligent. A city will be so idiot, so stupid, if it doesn't take into account the needs of, of their citizens, the needs of all their citizens, Good. the kids, the elderly people, Everyone. people with disability, once I said, uh, the, the, the tourists. Uh, so a city um, For develops 
with the citizens, a city that grows with the citizens, a city that is think by the citizens will be a city for all the citizens and will be a city, a city for all, including uh, people for, for disabilities. Thank you. Great. Very similar to what Fernando said, which is let's claim a city for everyone. Great. Dr. Saleh, and that. I think so much good things have been said about, uh, about the subject. And so I'd like just to shift attention to our part of the world, our region. Uh, again, from my personal experience, I think uh, I just reiterate what I said earlier. I think what's perhaps most demanding and lacking in some respect in the region is. Uh, it's not the political commitment. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants inclusion. Everybody wants a city for all. And everybody's willing to provide all the required resources to support that vision. I think what's required in our region is mostly around the two points I mentioned earlier. One is raising awareness. And by that, I mean uh, the right type of awareness about, about this whole philosophy of inclusion. The other one is continuing to upgrade the knowledge. Uh, and again, when I say awareness or knowledge, I talk about that you know the total spectrum of, of knowledge, whether it's basic understanding of the technicalities or the philosophy and the concept. So, I think if we work on these two uh, two areas and uh, develop, I don't want to want to sound too uh, too rigid, but you know develop some locally based index on awareness. Uh, I can see awareness being you know elevated in my part of the world. There's much more awareness now, the right type of awareness about the issue. But how can we monitor that? Can we? Do through surveys and through examination of public attitude or uh, official attitude to continuously make sure that we're making progress because you know that's to me that's key to success so uh, that's my my take on this thank you very thank much thank you dr sal we'll be happy to work with you on all that i think that's very exciting elizabeth uh, elizabeth no just to complete uh, your question the final conclusions uh, can be for me an exercise for the architects that I will work in Rio. I will provoke them to and we to try to find the solution. Thank you. Well, I would say that uh, we don't have a model because uh, we have a lot of bad press, a lot of experts, a lot of ar um, architects, but we need to share more the knowledge and the best practice. So each city can find the solution and take it in its own city for his citizens. That it was, I think, what I think. Because when I started, I wasn't able to find any help, any news, anything. Now it's easier. So we have to share more what we are doing. Elizabeth, thank you for that. We want to encourage a development of a knowledge platform as well as a global compact on accessible and inclusive cities. This global compact will help us find the political will and the commitments from key cities and then connect them with each other. So we want to work with you on this global compact for inclusive and accessible cities and we'll advance this work through the global network on disability inclusive and accessible urban development. So thank you all for being with us. I know there was a, a, one last comment from my friend Silvana I want us to say something. Um, just the last comment very quickly, Silvana, and then we'll close this session. Thank you, Victor. Um, I just have uh, like recommendation, you might say. Please. Um, all this uh, uh, enormous work and uh, this rich um, you know, information from all over. Um, I think what we need now is to create a mechanism uh, to, to enable like universities all over the world yes. start to have field yes. for building human resource in the different sectors yes. regarding uh, accessibility. Plus, um, you know, not everyone can go to conferences and sure. uh, not everyone is connected to 
people who are engaged in, in these processes. We need also to think how to develop uh, awareness advocacy material that can really um, uh, support business community to think about how to start the standards, uh, standardizing the accessibility within their institutions and not just uh, solidarate uh, occasionally. And finally, um, I think we also need to look at uh, the monitor part, how to all of us become more uh, supportive uh, for the monitoring the progress at the different level. And when you talk about digitals, for example, in the Arab world, it's very challenging issue. Now we wanted to make an, a website accessible in Lebanon we had to send letters to ask to so many countries to see what can we do, and in the end it was not so available and very expensive. So for, for these countries, we also need to encourage uh, partners and uh, agencies to join uh, efforts and create smart new ways for follow-up. And thank you all, really. You are doing great jobs, all of you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for that last word. And thank you all for joining us. We continue to work with you. And we will be in touch uh, in a follow-up email in the next few days. Thank you so much. We invite you to stay engaged. And we will meet at the World Urban Forum in 2020 in Abu Dhabi. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.